It's U of L today on 93.9 The Bill. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Bill. We're going to be talking to a couple of researchers here in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to thank all of you who occasionally come up to me uh, at baseball games, at the Kroger store, out in public, and say that you listen to the show and you really appreciate uh, some of the information we put out on this program and that uh, you're big supporters of the University of Louisville. So that's the whole whole idea behind the show to tell about all the good stuff going on at U of L. So on the show today, it's become quite the story again in the United States. Parents who refuse to have their children vaccinated against measles, chicken pox, or other preventable diseases leading to outbreaks of those diseases. A U of L pediatrician will be here to talk about the safety of vaccinations. But first, we've had several U of L guests on this show talking about research on electronic cigarettes, which, as we have found in recent surveys, have become more and more popular with young people. Dan Conklin is a professor of medicine, and he's one of the researchers who's been on the show, and he has been doing some groundbreaking research on e-cigarettes, their impact on health, and how they're impacting young people in particular. Dan, good to have you back on the show. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, Mark, and thanks for uh, doing this service to highlight some of the great things going on at uh, UofL, including our tobacco research. And as you uh, pointed out in your previous story, there is no vaccination against uh, youth <laughs> and, and tobacco, and this is a, a new form of infection that's going on, and it's highlighted. Uh, an infection, uh, that's what you're calling it, huh? Well, okay, I just put that yeah, in that there. Yeah, your but, words, uh, okay. But it is spreading, and uh, one of our recent studies out of the American Heart Association Tobacco Regulation Center here at U of L in our sixth year uh, found that in in collaboration with uh, colleagues at Boston University performed a study on initiation of uh, electronic cigarette use in in young kids uh, in middle school and, and early into high school. And what they found was very disturbing. That is, first use of, of tobacco now, the uh, top choice is electronic cigarette. So kids aren't, aren't going behind the school and smoking cigarettes when they're in seventh grade. They're pulling out their jewels and their devices that are electronic cigarettes. That's right. It's higher than any other uh, tobacco product right now. And what they also assessed in, in that study was not just the prevalence of e-cigarette, but how it related to use of other tobacco products. And what they found was very disturbing. Uh, two, two points of that uh, paper that was published in the JAMA Network Open. And you worked on that, right? I did not work on that, but my colleague, Rooney Botnagar. And oh, our, Rooney, that's right. But and, it did come out of the University of Louisville. Some, there were some folks. And, that, and colleagues yeah. at Boston University right. were, were the leads in the study. Um, but they found two things. One is that uh, the prior use of electronic cigarettes in youth does lead to increased chance that the the uh, youth would try uh, cigarettes. So and it's a gateway. It's a gateway from you, if your if your kid is smoking electronic cigarettes and telling you, "Oh, mom, they're safer. Don't worry about it." Bottom line, that kid has a good what what percentage of a chance to go on to smoking cigarettes? Right. So they didn't assess chronic. Uh, cigarette use, but it was increased uh, the odds of trying a conventional tobacco cigarette uh, within a few years of, of that uh, was an increased ro- odds ratio of like four times. Right. So yeah. the, the other finding was that uh, they found that this was occurring in typically low-risk uh, youth, and low-risk low are, are ones who would normally not be considered to ever try conventional tobacco cigarettes. And this can be kind of simplified that neither parent smoked cigarettes, so you don't get the exposure to to that behavior. And then also uh, the low-risk kids are usually at a higher socioeconomic status. So I'll just throw those two as part of that kind of what we would consider low risk. Well, they are trying electronic cigarettes, and then they are going on to mm-hmm to uh, try conventional tobacco. And we're, we're talking about kids who the average age in this study was like 13.4 years old. So these are just kids. 13 years old, probably, what, seventh grade probably. Yeah. So what you're talking about there. Yeah. Wow, that they yeah. get started. And there was another study out. There was a nationwide study that involved, I think, several schools that was in the media. It was on CNN and all the ne- major networks. And it came out maybe a month or so ago. And it talked about the percentage of kids that are now using 
tobacco products, either cigarettes or these electronic cigarettes, has started increasing again mm -hmm. for the first time in a long time. That the tobacco use had gone down, but because of e-cigarettes on the market, right. they're getting a hold of them and using them. Bad news, right? No, that's true, and and you're right. There there actually was a slight decline in uh, first use of e-cigarettes. Uh, over the last couple of years, but now it's jumped up right. dramatically, and that was with the introduction of uh, Juul. And Juul now has 80% uh, of the electronic cigarette market. And, and they're uh, doing an awful lot of advertising. They're doing a lot of advertising. They, they have uh, captured the imagination of, of the youth. Their, their sales over the last three year, years went from somewhere like 200 million in 2017 to a billion with a B uh, in 2018 and now estimated to go to over 3 billion in 2019. That's a, that's a lot of uh, e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Again, we're talking with Dan Conklin, who's a professor of medicine at the University of Louisville, and he does research on e-cigarettes. And I've been to your lab and I've seen the work you do with mice and, and uh, the impact that the, the smoke from e-cigarettes, or what do you call it, an aerosol, I guess? Mm -hmm. An aerosol. From, from e-cigarettes, uh, e and you're investigating and researching what kind of uh, impact that can have on the cardiovascular systems of the mice. What have you found? I know that these studies are just getting going on this, which is right. a whole other issue, but what have you found so far in terms of the chemicals and what's in an e-cigarette and how does it impact a mouse? Yeah. Oh, that's a great lead-in question, uh, Mark. You're right. We've been studying uh, e-cigarettes, uh, amongst other tobacco products, for the last five years. And we've highlighted in a previous show that uh, exposure to electronic cigarette aerosol, a lot of the users of uh, e-cigarettes call it vapor. Technically, it's an aerosol. It contains particles and gases. But exposure of uh, animals for uh, a prolonged period of time increases their um, disease of the blood vessels. We'll, we'll, we'll summarize it uh, as such. We're now looking at some of the more acute changes that occur that might lead to long-term changes. And, and the reason these acute changes, such as changes in heart rate or blood pressure um, or respiratory rate, tend to signal that there are chemicals in the aerosol that trigger these irritant re responses. Uh, biomarkers. Mm -hmm. uh, some folks have certain biomarkers that, uh, well, you explain what a biomarker is and how it's related to this research on e-cigarettes. Yeah, well, biomarker simply is a, a presence of a, a marker in a living uh, organism, but that marker can be related to harm, either directly, that is, it causes harm, uh, or it can be indirect. So sometimes we use biomarkers just to monitor uh, how much exposure you may have gotten to a, to a chemical. And we do these uh, biomarkers of exposure to uh, tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, which is actually uh, believe it or not, kind of challenging to find something unique in uh, electronic cigarette aerosols that are not found in many other products. In fact, the flavorants that we talk about are often found in foods. So you can't really use those to, to monitor e-cigarette use. Um, and many of the other uh, constituents, such as nicotine, are found in other uh, tobacco products. So you can't separate based on uh, so, it's a, so it's difficult to do research to figure out, are there biomarkers that make a person more susceptible uh, to disease if they smoke e-cigarettes? Yeah, and, and very complicated to separate the, right. the latter part. Like, yeah. are you only using e-cigarettes? E a lot, or of, a lot other of dual users uh, exactly. use cigarettes and e-cigarettes, right? No, you're hitting on a big point uh, that's challenging to do in human studies because many are dual users of, or poly users, that is more than two tobacco products. Um, and the frequency is not always clear, which would, you know, the percentage between the different products isn't always the same. Right. So that makes it challenging. But biomarkers of harm is something we can do in our animal studies. And so I pointed out some of those things that are acute, like blood pressure. Uh, we can measure that in animals just as we can in, in humans. 
Uh, we can measure atherosclerosis as a biomarker of uh, change in the blood vessel. And, and um, in between, we can measure things in your blood. Mm -hmm. uh, so we often look at stem cells. This is something that's been going on in our research over many years that we're, we're looking at whether or not cardiovascular stem cells change with exposures. And that's still ongoing and not clear with e-cigarettes if right. they do the same thing that uh, uh, cigarettes do to our stem cells. Right. Well, we've only got about a minute left, okay. so, and I've got two quick, quick questions, mm -hmm. and they're the, they're the multi-bazillion dollar questions on this one. Okay. And I know what the answer is already going to be. <laughs> e-cigarettes, are they safer than regular cigarettes and, uh, quote, healthier, which is essentially what Juul is pushing uh, when you see the ads on TV, than using regular cigarettes? From the right. early studies, what, have you, what can you tell us? Well, I would say for cardiovascular risk, the, the jury is out. And I would say uh, not all risk is created equal. There is consensus that there are fewer biomarkers of cancer in uh, electronic cigarette aerosols. But those compounds that contribute to cardiovascular disease risk, including nicotine, are still present. And so we cannot rule out that cardiovascular disease risk uh, may be equivalent mm -hmm. to that of using uh, conventional cigarettes. All right, Dan Conklin, it's always good to talk to you and yeah. always interesting. There are measles outbreaks in at least five states that I can recall, and Kentucky's governor admitted he exposed his kids to chickenpox rather than getting them vaccinated and causing quite the hubbub on social media and in the news. So what in the heck is going on here? Get Dr. Gary Marshall is a UofL pediatrician who has produced an app for vaccines and has strong opinions about them. Gary, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Good Thanks to see for you. for having me. What the heck is going on? I mean, all of a sudden, out of the blue, we start hearing about the anti-vaxxers and parents not wanting to vaccinate their kids and measles outbreaks. Is there just a change in the social uh, fabric of America that parents aren't doing this? Or what's going on out there? Um, yeah, your guess is as good as mine. It's, it's kind of hard to believe that uh, almost two decades after measles was eliminated from the United States, we're now seeing outbreaks and cases again. In fact, we're on track to have more cases of measles in the U.S. this year than we've had since measles was eliminated, which was in the year 2000. Oh, that's a long time. 19 years then, right? Is that when the MMR vaccine came on? The MMR, we've actually had a measles vaccine since 1963, and then we've had an MMR vaccine since 1971. So we've had the vaccine. It's safe. It's recommended for all children. And the problem is that there are some parents who are not getting their kids vaccinated. So it's some ways it's not rocket science that we're seeing outbreaks. The other thing is that uh, uh, oftentimes the unvaccinated children tend to cluster in the same geographic region. And so you have a lot of susceptibles and all it takes is for the importation of a case and and there you go, you have an outbreak. And you know, it, Mark, it's, it's really sad to me that there are so many people who are misled into thinking that the vaccine is more dangerous than the disease because I've seen the disease. I'm, well, those of a certain age have seen it, mm -hmm. and I've seen it in my own medical career. When there was an outbreak in Philadelphia in, in 1989 when I was uh, in training there. It's a terrible disease, and uh, it's not just the acute morbidity where you have fevers and rash and et cetera, but one or two in a, in a thousand kids will die from the infection or they'll get encephalitis. And um, some of them will even go on many years later to have a, a long-term complication that leads to death, which is called SSPE. So it makes no sense that we can prevent this disease and there's there are people who intentionally leave their children vulnerable to the disease. Well, you know what uh, some of the parents are saying out there is that for religious reasons, I'm not going to have my kids get vaccinated. Um, is yeah, that, a, so which, which, is that a legitimate which, reason for you? Uh, which, which religion is that? I, I, <laughs> I don't know of too many religions that espouse as a theological tenant that children should get sick and suffer and die from diseases when that can be prevented. So, uh, and, and the truth is, there really is no mainstream religion that has that belief. In fact, you'd argue just the opposite, right? That we're taught to care for our children and to care for each other, and that by being vaccinated, we're doing that. We actually are preventing disease among 
uh, the people we live with. We're talking with Dr. Gary Marshall, who's a U of L pediatrician and teaches classes at the University of Louisville as well. Um, let's talk about the measles outbreak, then we'll get into chicken pox, the flu, some other things. But the measles outbreak, I think, as I mentioned in the open there, I think there's five states that have had some form of an outbreak, it's, right? Does that sound 19 right? 19 cases where, it, uh, uh, where measles has now been reported, including Kentucky. Right. But in terms of an outbreak where you have several cases, they're, they're in their pockets, like in Washington State, I think, New York Correct. City. Yes. Um, and in, the, in each of those, they were uh, kids that went overseas for the most part, right, and came back, had not been vaccinated in the United States, came back and infected other kids. Is that yeah. essentially so, it? So this is, uh, it's kind of confusing when we say that measles was eliminated from the United States in 2000. And in fact, in 2016, has was, was eliminated uh, from the entire region of the Americas. So how, how can we still see cases if it's been eliminated? That's really kind of an epidemiological distinction. So um, uh, elimination means there are not successive waves of transmission, like concentric rings of spread of the disease. And it happens when, when, you, when you don't have enough immune people in the population. So we still see um, cases because those, as you point out, can be imported from places where measles is still endemic. But those outbreaks are relatively contained because a few susceptibles get sick, but then it doesn't spread out further into the community. Because everybody else has been inoculated. Yes. And so when you get into places like Washington State or Oregon or there's a county up in New York State where many of the children are not vaccinated, that's when you have trouble because that's when that virus will spread. It's one of the most contagious diseases that is known to man. Measles? And yes, Did absolutely. Did not know that. Okay. The attack rate is 90% in households. If So if there's a case and there's a susceptible person living in the household, 90% chance that person will get the disease. Wow. Just like chicken Is it airbor airborne and sticks around? Is That's that right. the deal? Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So all you got to do is sneeze once, and it's out there in the air and hangs kind around the living room for a while. Floats huh? around in the air. And in fact, there's uh, for chicken pox, for example, there's well-documented cases where it literally floats down the hallway, like in a hospital or in a clinic. Talk about Dr. Gary Marshall, U of L pediatrician. Is there a chance that this could happen in Kentucky and southern Indiana? Measles outbreak? Mm-hmm. Well, um, um, I, I don't know offhand what our uh, MMR vaccination rates are. I mean, they're very good, but there is a small percentage of people in, uh, across the country who are not immunizing. And I don't think we'll see an outbreak unless measles virus lands in a community where there are a lot of people who are unvaccinated. This actually happened not far uh, up the road in Indiana in 2005, where there was a um, church community that, uh, for some reason, many of the parents in that church community decided not to vaccinate their children. It, it had nothing to do with the church or the religion or anything. It's just that they, um, I, I guess, uh, convinced each other this was the right path to take. One of the kids went over to uh, Eastern Europe for a mission trip, got measles, came back uh, ex contagious for measles, spread it throughout the church, and uh, there were 30 or 35 people who got sick. Many in, were hospitalized, some in the ICU. So the point is, if that child had come back to a uh, community where everyone was vaccinated, she would have been sick, but no one else would have gotten sick. But right. when you have a lot of susceptibles in one place, it's a problem. Are there any, um, I mean, we've seen some of the discounted studies that were done and the, the papers that were out there about some of these vaccines. Is, is there any chance that any of these vaccines could cause autism or any, uh, you know, internal problems for children if you're given the vaccine? Or are you absolutely convinced there's, there's no danger to any of these vaccines? Well, I mean, to say there's no danger is like saying there's no danger in me walking out of this studio onto Cardinal Boulevard, right? There is a danger. Somebody could be, um, uh, what do they do, skateboarding yeah, down skateboarding. the thing and knock me over. So everything, there's, you know, there's risks in everything. So I, I, I would be lying to you if I said there was no risk, absolutely no risk in vaccination. Of course there is some risk. Uh, you can have an allergic reaction. Fortunately, it only happens one in a million times. Um, you could get a little fever or a rash from MMR. You can get a, a sore arm. Um, but autism, no. There is, when are we going to stop asking this question, okay? It's been asked for 20 years now. There are studies that involve of literally tens of millions of children that show no relationship between these vaccines and autism. 
Autism will turn out to be something related to the genes that are expressed in the developing brain in utero, and, and, and I think we're actually getting closer to understanding that. Again, we're talking with Dr. Gary Marshall, who's a U of L pediatrician and uh, specializes a little bit, anyways, in vaccinations. You wrote a, didn't you do an app or wrote a book or something about? Right, uh, I, I have a, a book called uh, the Vaccine Handbook, which is actually we call the Purple Book, but it's now going into its eighth edition, so it's been out since 2004, and it uh, it is also available as an app, uh, which is free. So mm-hmm. if you have an iOS device, you can you can download it and and. And read it. So if you're a parent who has questions about vaccinating your kids, they can go to this app and it's called what? It's called the Vaccine Handbook. So the book is really geared towards providers, right. so but doctors. But it's written in uh, normal human language. <laughs> I can language. read it and understand it. Is <laughs> Even that what you're you could say, understand it. <laughs> uh, and uh, chapter seven is the largest chapter in the book, and it's all about how addressing the concerns that parents have. You know, we had a uh, a child that was hospitalized not long ago for meningitis, and it was a, a baby who had not been immunized. These were wonderful parents, really intelligent. And after she recovered, which fortunately she did, and she had a form of meningitis that could have been prevented by vaccinations, they they basically said, we're so sorry we didn't immunize our child. We could have prevented this. And I basically told them, look, you know, in some ways you're the victim because you were victimized by the misinformation that you read on the internet or on Facebook or whatever the, it mm-hmm. is. And and I understand how you can be misled that way. But in that sense, you're the victim, and, and your child was a victim of that. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the chicken pox now, because you got a couple things going on in Kentucky. One, you had a governor who said he didn't vaccinate his kids, and he exposed them to the chicken pox uh, rather than vaccinate them. That was number one. Then number two, you had up in northern Kentucky, the northern Kentucky Health Department, uh, said we are not going to let kids in school unless they've been vaccinated against chicken pox, and you've now got a student at a Catholic <laughs> school um, suing the Northern Kentucky Health Department saying you can't do that. It's against my religious beliefs. So you got two things going on, uh, throwing information out there that basically a chicken box vaccine is not necessarily a good thing. What was your response when you saw those two different well, sure. things? Well, let, let me comment on uh, those things uh, separately. So, um, and, and this is, um, you know, kind of interesting that the case in northern Kentucky uh, really centered on one of the high school kids who is a, a star basketball player, uh, was unimmunized, and there is a, an outbreak at this school where there were first six and then 18 and then 32 cases of chickenpox, so spreading very quickly. And the health department is... Um, given a mandate by the law to protect the public. And so in, in pers- pursuance of that uh, mandate, they shut down the school. And then they also barred the uh, athletes from, from uh, competing around the state because they didn't want to spread the chicken pox elsewhere. Um, and, and keep in mind, too, that it's not just unvaccinated people. There are kids who can't be vaccinated. So kids who have leukemia, who are in maintenance chemotherapy, or, or, or arthritis who are on biologics, they cannot be vaccinated. So the only way they're protected is to have everyone around them protect, uh, pro, uh, mm-hmm. immunized against chickenpox. So the state um, did not want other kids in the state to be exposed. And actually, that went to uh, there was a hearing for a temporary restraining order last week, and the judge uh, uh, sided with the health department right. and said, no, the, the health department can prevent They it. had the power to uh, do that, yeah. A, interesting anecdote. Only in Kentucky would this be about basketball, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Well, some other state, Texas, it might be about football, so yeah. there you go. And um, uh, so, you know, it, and then as far as uh, the, um, uh, well, so chicken pox parties, right? So um, I'm... That's what they call them, chicken pox parties, where a bunch of parents get together and say, we're going to expose all our kids to chicken pox, right? Right. So that they can't get it in the future. Yeah. Let's just do it under a controlled circumstance. Really stupid thing to do, okay? Can it's you tell us really, what you really think? I'm going to tell you. It's really <laughs> stupid, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, I've seen children die from complications of chicken pox. Second of all... Um, this is entirely preventable with the vaccine. So the vaccine program we have now, two doses in childhood, um, 98% effective in preventing chickenpox. And we've seen, used to be 4 million cases of chickenpox a year, 11,000 kids hospitalized, 100 people die every year of chickenpox. Since this program started, the number of deaths has gone down to a handful. 
and the number of cases hospitalized, very, very small. But it's not just about preventing those complications of the disease. Well, first of all, it's about preventing the disease, which is a miserable disease, you know, mm-hmm. 200 to 500 itchy open sores on your skin and fever and all of that. But beyond that, a million adults a year get shingles. And 20 or 30 percent, you've had it. There I've you go. It. It okay. no fun. I think that's a HIPAA violation. Oh. But uh, <laughs> no. so, you know, it, and that is not fun. And a third of them go on to have pain in the spot on their skin for a month, and 10% go on to have pain for three months. That's called post-herpetic neuralgia. It's a horrible disease, and the pain can be so bad that it's actually, there are suicides that have been linked to persistent Oh, it's awful. Uh, pers- it feels neuralgia. like it's in your bones, I can tell you. The only way you get shingles is if you have the chickenpox virus in your body, right, right. from childhood. I did as a kid. And uh, I had chickenpox too as right. a kid, but fortunately I've, I've gotten the shingles yeah. vaccine to prevent that. <laughs> but the point is that you have two choices. You can be infected with the wild type virus, which is the stronger virus, the one that can live in your body forever and then come up as shingles later and cause this. Or you can get the vaccine, which also lives in your body, but much less likely to reactivate as shingles. So why would you take your kid and intentionally expose them to a disease that has all these complications and all this morbidity and the potential for them to get horrible shingles and PHN later in life? when it could be prevented with a vaccine. Talking with Dr. Gary Marshall, a U of L pediatrician and a, a, a little bit of an expert on vaccinations. All right, so a couple more, more questions, and then we got to wrap this up. I want to ask about the flu vaccine. Any clue as to how effective the flu vaccine has been this season? Well, it's been better this year than in the past year. Last year, um, and, and, and let me just say one thing. When you talk about effective, we define that in different ways, okay? so It keeps me from getting the flu. <laughs> that, that would be effective. Um, no, actually not. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what I consider that's why effective. you're a radio host and that's not right. a doctor, okay? <laughs> so a vaccine can prevent the flu, but if it doesn't prevent the flu, what we hope is that it prevents you from getting really sick or dying or winding up in the hospital. So when you hear these efficacy numbers of 30%, 40%, that's usually, that usually means it prevented the infection, But if you look at the efficacy against death and hospitalization, it's much higher than that. So 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 bottom line, if it helps to tone down the flu, you only have it for a couple days instead of a week. Exactly. That means in your mind it worked. Exactly. If we can prevent deaths, uh, last year or the year before, something like 80,000 people died of the flu. I know. Okay? And I wish we had better vaccines, and, and, and we are working on that. Someday we will have a better flu vaccine, but for now this is what we've got. Last one: cervical cancer vaccine. Oh, why goodness. aren't Why aren't more um, families having their daughters and their sons get the vaccine? So, so more and more are. I can't answer for you why, but I'll tell well, you. When you talk to your patients, what do they tell you? And when you say, "Hey, you ought to get this vaccine," um, what do they say? My child's not going to be exposed, which is not true. <laughs> my kid's not going to have sex. Um, yes, and. Um, uh, you, you know, all yes. So they that's don't the, think the bolts, they right? don't think that's going to. Yes, right. exactly. Um, but I just think, and so again, they're misled and they don't get it. This is a vaccine against cancer. All right, Gary. It's always great talking to you, Doctor Gary Marshall from University of Louisville School of Medicine. He's a pediatrician at U of L, and they can reach you through ULP, right? Yes. University of Louisville Physicians. All right, Gary. As always, thanks for being on the show.